so much that when we read it thoughtfully, even moderately thoughtfully, we find helpful and useful to us because it's dealing with people's soul coming out in song. And people write songs about things that matter to them and that they care about passionately. So Psalms is a very human collection of songs, a very spiritual collection of songs, a very helpful one, aligned with our own society's needs, but then really not aligned with our own society's self-designed solutions to those needs. Did you get that? That's important. That's really fundamental. That's why I really, you know, really want to build up and emphasize this issue. This is crucial to what we're going to be doing. The Psalms are songs, so they're passionate expressions. And their songs, because they're songs, they come out of the soul. They come out of things that people really care about. They're from a strange land, but they affect us very much because they analyse people's perceived needs and problems, which people today are aware of. But solutions are very different to people's self-designed solutions to those problems that they will identify with the songs. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we start with a spiritual man's analysis of the thing that, along with the avoidance of pain, probably motivates human beings more than much else. What motivates human beings more than much else than pain left to one side? Happiness. Our song we sang before this was our same song of gladness, right? Here is the psalmist's song of gladness. Here's his happy song. Have you got a happy song? Got a song for doing happy with? Some of our young men, as they've grown up, have had songs that they sing a lot, because we've noticed them singing. But, well, I won't, I won't pick out individuals, but they've had, they've had their songs, this and that, and some of them have a happy song, right? Have your kids grown up with a happy song? Okay, well, let's not embarrass everybody. But, but, this is the way, here's the psalmist's happy song. This is the song of the blessed man. Blessed is the man. Oh, the guy's happy. Now, it's not a sermon, it's a song. It's a celebration of human happiness found God's way. And it starts by celebrating the profile of the happy man. What is that profile? Verses 1 to 2 of Psalm 1. It's all on the wall. It always is. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked. Who walks in step with the wicked is not going to be happy guy. And the psalmist is celebrating that. Blessed is the one who doesn't walk in the step with the wicked. Or stand in the way of the sinners take. Or sit in the company of mockers. Like is on the law of the Lord and meditates on his Lord day and night. Here's my happy song. Here's the happy man. Happy is the man who. Oh, I don't know what the tune was. <laughs> and it's obvious. <laughs> Blessed is the one who does not, firstly, walk in step with the wicked. The psalmist is celebrating that. He's not preaching that. Why is that important? The psalmist is not simply saying, you ought to do this. The psalmist is saying, look at this and ain't this great. Well, wow, Lord, that's fantastic. You see the difference? He's celebrating that the man is blessed who doesn't walk in step with the wicked. Who wants wickedness to lead to blessing and happiness? Somebody who's fundamentally twisted in the head. It's quite common, actually. Mm. Obviously, being fundamentally twisted in the head is quite common. Mm. Isn't it? Um, but the blessed man is the one who... And that's a great thing, says the psalmist. I'm, I'm rejoicing about that. It makes me glad that the blessed man is not the one who walks in step with the wicked. Now most people actually, when you think about it, most people I encounter want to believe that. Most people I encounter, they, they, they like to see there's a kind of a dignity, a rightness about that rightness. People, like, people appreciate that. They want that to be the case. Of course, there's a loud minority who want to rant against it, will not have godliness and, and their bitterness against God wanting to, to remove any possibility of, of positive outcomes from godliness. They will give full vent to that. They're the minority who want to see Christians as, you know, poor people. Most of the people I come across, they might not want my faith, but they definitely want to think it works. And that's good. At least for people like me. Now, I don't know whether, you know, unless that is the case, it's completely desperate for everybody. <laughs> And it's hopeless anyway, but I mean, a lot of people who want to see that you're a Christian and it's good for you, that you're blessed by that. In any case, let's remember this guy's singing a song, he's rejoicing over the fact that the blessed man is the one who doesn't walk in step with the wicked. It's a song, 
pretty literary song, it's got a clear, well-crafted structure, but the fact that it's a good song doesn't detract from the rejoicing here. Here he goes. He's celebrating, he's singing, that the happy person is the one who doesn't walk in step with the wicked. He, he starts off by celebrating in song the things that don't accompany happiness. So he's celebrating that negatively, <laughs> blessed is the one who doesn't walk in the... See what I mean? It's interesting, isn't it? Negatively, happiness, blessedness, doesn't stick to the man. Now, funny, I don't know why, it is the masculine form. It is Isha and Isha, right? I don't know why that is. I can't tell you the answer to that, but I saw it in the Hebrew, and I thought, like, oh, why is that? Somebody might think of something. He's actually saying the man, but contextually, no doubt, man embraces woman, and, and it's true for everybody. Blessed is the person, then, who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked. Walk in step with the wicked. What's that? Well... In the more recent NIVs have got walk in step with the wicked, even remember, blessed is he that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, you know, that stuff. Remember that from the authorised? Literally, it's walking in the council. Well, I don't know how you walk in a council because a council is a piece of advice. But he's not living with it. He's not going forward with the advice of the wicked. It's not a great translation in that NIV, walk in step with the wicked, but it's getting at, it's getting at the point. It's about lining up your life with your peer group. Now you know what your peer group is, it's, it's, it's your, those you consider to be your friends and your equals, it's those people who influence your thinking. Yeah? People who influence the way you think and therefore the way you act. It's about the advice that you listen to. Free advice, remember, is often worth every penny you give for it, yeah? Okay? Yeah. You know that. <laughs> but it's about the things that you allow to form how you think. How's that going to be? It's about where you soak up your values and your framework of thinking and living and your ideas. Your framework for understanding your life and for understanding this world. Where are you going to soak that up? It's kind of similar to the next thing happy people don't do. I find it a bit odd talking about the things happy people don't do, but it's going to be very balanced in a minute because he's going to go on from here. Happy people don't stand in the way sinners take. So happy people don't walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take. Now you see, it's kind of parallel all this, isn't it? We're going to start getting the idea that, as Craigie puts it, of course, the three parallel lines of verse 1 are poetically synonymous and thus all described in slightly different ways the evil company which should be avoided by the righteous. Which being translated means... He's going to kind of say the same thing three times here. I'm just varying it and painting a bit. Because in a song you paint pictures with words. Don't you? Mm -hmm. Here's how he's doing it. In practice, the blessed person avoids soaking up all dimensions and depths of the way of the wicked. And that's where the source of blessedness or happiness takes root. There is blessedness, says the Bible, in not standing in the ways that sinners take. That is, taking care you don't hang about where they're going to cross your path and put their ideas in your head. You don't want their ways, so you don't stand in their way, where their fellowship will develop to drag you along with them. Because thought patterns are easily caught. They're much more easily caught from other people than they're rationalised out for yourself. Much more commonly. It takes conscious energy and effort not to just soak up the ideas and attitudes of those you associate with. Now that is not to say, Christian, head off to the ghetto. You do understand that you are not saying that. I hope you know me well enough by now to realise I'm not saying that. It is to say, don't go looking for barriers down fellowship with godlessness. Don't dawdle your mind beside the paths that sinners go down because you'll soak stuff up there. Here's an illustration. There's a natural tendency. You notice when you're out walking on the hill and you walk in any direction. You notice there's a natural tendency to veer off the point you're heading towards. Because there's a natural tendency to veer downhill. You notice that? In the fog, right? Throughout the night, in lost in the fog, just keep thinking you're going slightly uphill and keep following your compass or something. Because there's this natural tendency to just drift subconsciously to the weight down 
Blessed is the man. Here's the guy. He's marvellous as a son. Look at this wonderful truth. Blessed is the one who doesn't walk in step with the wicked, who doesn't stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. Who listens to Radio 4 comedy on Friday night? How much of their argument proceeds in anti Christian, not just on anti Christian directions on the basis of mockery? And that can start to affect the way you think. For most people, it does. The third thing, sitting in the company of mockers. Why is mockery dangerous spiritually? It's only a laugh, is it? Because what mockery does is it seeks to create swathes of force where no rational person is in force and where he exists. Suasion moves you. Persuasion proceeds on the basis of reasons for being swayed. <laughs> you see what I mean? Because of this, you're swayed, you know, personally, right? Okay? So, mockery tries to create change in you where there's no rational reasoning for that. So, a person can be happy from a negative perspective by avoiding the advice or counsel, the lifestyle of the way, and the assembly, the company, of wicked sinners and mockers. Avoid them. Is that right? <laughs> you know it's a trick question, don't you? <laughs> you, you say, yeah, that is a trick question. If we say one, he's going to say the other. It's been like questions on QI, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, yes. You stop them. <laughs> yeah. If you're there with them. Well, you might. You might Take not. the argument away from it. <laughs> but the question goes, can you be happy by avoiding them? And the answer is, you know, because we should seek to have non-Christian friends. But, whilst we go looking for the wicked and the sinners and the mockers, fully acknowledging without the grace of God, that's where we are coming from, true, too. We can go looking for them to try and bring people in these categories to Jesus. Yes, of course we do. But not to have them run our peer group. So this has also far been about allegiance, one's choice of one's own peer group. You choose who you're going to be influenced by. You do that consciously or subconsciously, and this psalm is saying, you know, it's great to do that consciously. It's great to do that consciously, to choose your peer group consciously. This isn't about not knowing the wicked, the sinners, and the mockers. It's about not soaking up what they've got going on. It's actually very explicitly saying, not walking in their ways. Not standing in their way. Not sitting in their seat. This is about falling for the peer pressure of those categories of people and conforming your thinking and then your actions to the standard. And happy people don't do that. We'll see why at the end. If people do blame peer pressure, don't they? they? They blame peer pressure for bad behavior. And if you do that, that's just an admission of irresponsibility. You haven't taken responsibility. But who's going to be your peer group? Who's going to influence you? So negatively, the way to be happy is to avoid bad company corrupting your character. Not to avoid bad company necessarily, unless they are. You know, if you're an alcoholic, you stay away from the drinking crew. You know? If you've got problem, a weakness of vulnerability, you take note of that. But you take note of it not because of who they are, but because of the influence that they have upon you. Bad company shapes your responses and behaviour, of course but more explicitly embraces and conveys into your thinking a thoroughgoing negativity. Human thinking left to itself is really, really negative by nature. Have you noticed this? Okay, let's go like this. Have you heard of CBT? Yes. CBT is Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, for those who did not. And it, it, it's, it got, well, that sounds complicated. It's a counselling approach for people with depression, host of other issues that are capable of being addressed cognitively. So if you can get to your mind through your mind, then it works um, like that. By addressing your own thinking. Now, I'm going to simplify it beyond all belief, but, but, and fairness as well. It's got so much more to offer. But basically, it comes back, and many people would say, CBT often comes back to this. Accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative. Is there a song? Mm -hmm. There is, isn't there? Have you, have you heard it? 
There's a song there about accentuating the positive and eliminating the negative. So it's naturally very, very easy to think negatively in any given situation. Callum wants to contribute. You know what I'm going to say now, Lee. I don't How know. do you sing the song? How do you sing the song? You want the song, don't you? I want the song. We'll look on YouTube and see if it's there later on. The psalmist has done this. He says, the happy man eliminates from his experience the company that fosters negativity and criticism and mockery and all those things. So here's what you do first of all, someone. Here's what he's rejoicing about. Blessed is the man who eliminates the negativity. So sits, sits on those things in the language of CBD. Does that make sense? And he's rejoicing over that. Because that negativity arises out of the destructiveness and the, the destruction in creation brought about by the fall. And secondly, the psalmist seems like this, moving on. Negatively, blessed is the man who does not all those things. Secondly, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. Here we are, can all smile and relax. We've got away from the negativity. We don't have to sort of resist those things anymore. You know what we're saying about not nurturing the negative but eliminating it? The psalmist says you need to do this turning away from negativity in a positivistic kind of way. Not just getting negative about negativity, because that's easy, but positively then embracing and filling yourself up with what is actually really positive. And the first issue to take care of is your delight. Blessed is the man who delights in a particular place. See that? Mm. Take delight. I'm going to be you know, simple and straightforward about this. It is important to personal happiness to choose delight. To choose to be delighted. This is okay. okay. Now, many of us perhaps with our Christian backgrounds or whatever that would teach us that it's not okay to be that happy. <laughs> is that fair? You know, I don't want to be sort of mocking at anybody because it's just uh, something about mockery. I don't want to be doing that. But there are Christian settings in which, you know, you do grow up thinking perhaps, or you do get the impression perhaps, it's not okay to be happy. And the Bible is saying it's okay to be delighted. In the right things. You choose to be delighted. It's something you do. Blessed is the man who delights in. It is not something that creeps up and surprises you. You take delight. It's cognitive. You make something your delight. Here's my illustration. Ready? What do you see? Oh. Oh. <laughs> well, that didn't say a cow. It's not a cow. Is Definitely that, a bull. He's a big lad. Is that the one? Dad, is that the little champion? Aha! Only one. Not Black Glen Cole, that is. What a beast. I mean, look at that. That's that, amazing, isn't that it? That is pretty impressive. That is pretty impressive. He's an absolute delight, he is. But, but not to your average British limousine cattle judge. Can you see why? Most people wouldn't consider giving him the Priscelli trophy, which he won last week at the Royal Welsh. They wouldn't consider it. Most, most limousine cattle judges wouldn't give it. Can you see why? He's black. It's because he's black. Now he's full pedigree and black. And under the skin, he is the most amazing bull. I walked past him, he was, he was lying on it on the deck and I walked back, wow, what is that? That is amazing. I spent, how long were we there, Callum? Ages, just looking at this bull. Oh no, he's amazing. He is, and he's got some of the breeding that we got in, in one or two of ours. And I, oh, is that, he's an amazing bull. I'm delighted by that. I stood behind him for ages, just lapping up the pleasure. What an amazing beast God has made him to be. But and I find this very unusual. He wouldn't be everyone's delight. Can you believe that? That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is the point, isn't it? Slap the point. You take. <laughs> That's a good fact. Good you fact. take delight. And for one man, it'll be his bull. And for another man, it'll be his car. And for another bull, it'll be his roses or his cabbages. Right? But you take delight. Do it. Enjoy! I, I, I really... I really <laughs> You've got that look of sympathy on your faces for me now, but... I really enjoyed that. What a marvellous exhibit. What an exhibition of the creators and art. And the wisdom he's given to man, the breed of beasts like that. He's that double Muslim at the back end. 
Can you see that? Yeah. That is out of this world. You take delight. And it is really important for the glory of God and the people that we become that when we see something delightful, we take a moment to gaze and give thanks for it. And I don't care if you think I'm bonkers, but that's amazing. And I will stop and give thanks. And it's important for my soul not to get a chance to do that. So could you go look at some roses for a minute or something and let me get on with it? <laughs> It is important to take delight in examples of excellence in the Creator's creation. Mm -hmm. To pause, and to ponder, and to praise. But it is crucially important to human happiness to take that delight somewhere that is truthfully delightful. Because there is an immense danger that we delight in that which is false. Focusing on delight on things that actually breed despair is going to leave you where? In despair. Focusing your delight like a small child on dirt is going to leave you covered in dirt, possibly eating it. You need to focus what it is you will delight in. It is your choice what you will delight in. Focusing your delight on what is good, this is the way of the happy man. Take. Delight. What will you sing about that, psalmist? Take delight, he says. Blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And who meditates on that all day and night. Are you sure? Are you sure? The what? The law of the Lord gives you delight. I can hear the mockers or not. Can you hear the mockers? Surely the way to be happy is to throw off restraint. Surely there is no human happiness bound to a set of rules and regulations and restraints. What does that do to human dignity? I, I can hear them. I can hear voices. No. I, I can hear those guys in my imagination. With that law, this chaos. Well, that's an uncommon way of looking at the world, but it is one I should. I've got another illustration. Can you bear it? What's this? Don't bleed. Thank you. That's a dog lead, okay? It's a restraint. It is there to stop the wearer doing certain stuff and make the wearer live with other certain stuff, yeah? It's a leash. Well, if that is a leash, what is that? Oh, no, 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 no. That is a dog leash, that is a dog. And that there is meant to stop him doing stuff that he wants to do, correct? You would have thought then, wouldn't you, that whenever the thing on the left came out, the thing on the right would hightail it away and be gone. Funny how it doesn't work like that. Funny how it doesn't work like that. Because the thing on the right knows the thing on the left is good. Because the dog can see the lead and you can do the equation. Here's the equation. Lead plus dog equals a very nice walk with the boss. Blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on it day and night. I've got another interruption. I don't know what I'm doing with this today. Come on, Callum. This is not using bells. Is this intelligent or just TV? Come on. Um, there's some dogs, like Key Corps, for example, who just leg it when they see a lead. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they're the lawless, the unruly, and they, they walk with the wicked. Let's get it on that. Oh, Tom! Is <laughs> somebody making tea? <laughs> Come on, Tom! As an example this week, I was mm -hmm. told that um, a man, a woman, was walking down the road with a dog on a leash. Let the dog off the leash and yeah. went immediately for a cat. Went immediately for a cat? Yeah. I thought you were saying for a car. Which would be a very sad and unpleasant <laughs> story. Well, some dogs do go for cars, but... Yes, cats. yes. Well, look. That's normal. Let's go back to where we're going to launch the next bit off and say this again. Because that's great. The dog sees the lead come out 
And the dog doesn't hightail it away, the dog hightails it towards. Mm. And the lead goes on, and the dog knows what that means is we're going for a walk with the boss. Okay? And the psalmist is saying, blessed is the man who takes delight in the law of the Lord. What does it mean? It means you're going for a walk with the boss. Mm. And that's great. The happy way is not always to throw off a string. <clears throat> the way to be happy may be to pick it up. Because surely there is human happiness that is connected to a set of rules and regulations and restraints. It's only the lawless who don't think that. They must, though, be the right laws. And the psalmist is saying it delights in the law of the Lord. Explicitly. The law of the Lord. That, filling the mind, leads to blessedness, to happiness, and constantly filling your mind with it. Not only do you eliminate the negative, you accentuate and feed your mind on the positive, you delight yourself in the perfect expression of the same healthy, happy mind of God. Have you ever been in that situation where you're chatting with somebody and you're listening? It's a pastoral problem, probably. My pastoral problem. You can be sitting listening to people so often and they just bless them. Their minds have gone. Right? And at the end of the day, you end up thinking you're as mad as they are. Have you come across that experience? It's affected your own thinking so, so much. Well, look, here's, here's the equation in the psalm, right? You expose your mind to the same, the supremely healthy psychology of the living God. And it orders your internal chaos. Happy is that man. As you delight in it. As you meditate on God's law, we don't do enough of that. And as you do so persistently, perseveringly, as it says here in these verses, day and night. This is nothing like just doing your Bible readings. Do you feel good when you've done your Bible readings? Yeah, it's nothing like this. You have to read it. Of course you do. Or it's not going to go in. But you have to read it for what it's saying. You need to be thinking while you're doing that. Thoughtfully developing a steadily increasing understanding of that text and then the next text and text upon text and passage upon passage filling together the bits and pieces of all of that into a coherent, interlinking, big picture and that meta-narrative for your whole world before you can even begin to benefit from taking delight in it. You've got to, got to be working on this and internalising this word. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think of shoving food in your mouth and swallowing it without chewing it, would you? What would happen if you did? Well, the same thing happens to people who do their Bible readings. No benefit to you that way. Chewing, metabolizing, reading, studying, thinking, feeding, exercising faith muscles on the basis of what it's saying against the weight of the temptations of world, flesh, and devil. Given strength by the hardships and the difficulties held in tension with the Word of God in which you delight and on which you meditate day and night. And the uncertainties and the sufferings of everyday life working those muscles and making you strong because you're feeding your mind continually as the psalmist says in the Lord of the Lord. It's the work, it's the passion, it's the delight of the blessed man's life. So there is the discipline that leads to blessedness. Utterly countercultural though it seems, there is the way to happy days. Negatively and positively. What do they look like, those happy days? See, they don't even look like what perhaps the people around us, the Council of the Wicked and all that mocky stuff, say is happy. Here's what happiness is. Here's what it looks like. It's like a tree. The great thing about a tree, it gives shadows in which, into which people in trouble can come. The tree gives shade to those who are feeling the heat. It's like a tree that's planted by streams of water, which has got fruit and leaves. In short, there's a fruitful, productive, useful life going on here. It's quite a picture of prosperity. Those who delight in God's law find themselves motivated to meditate on his law continually. They take God's word deep into their minds and they feed their minds, not on the mindset of the people in verses 1 and 2, but on the mindset of the Creator God by chewing over his law day and night, not just doing their Bible readings. Because it says that they got it today. Yeah? See, 
trouble is you, you think things over and you meditate on stuff and what's going on in your head and you're like, I'm thinking this through. No, this the tree is not a pipe. That tree's not a pipe. There's a world of difference between a tree and a pipe, even though water's involved. What that tree does is soak up that water and it doesn't just channel it into the next, it channels it into its own life. And out of the life that it derives from the water and everything else, that it's transformed and it's changed into a fruit-bearing organism. But it has to become, I'm using the word metabolized, do you know what I mean? Benefited from for, for nourishment. That's what it produces, fruit. But what it needs is its leaves to sustain it through times of drought. The fruit is there for somebody else. The leaves are there to keep it going in its fruit-bearing. Fruit for the farmer, leaves for its own preservation. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit for others in season and whose leaf does not wither. And the lady prospers. Both leaf and fruit are taken care of so long as the tree keeps its roots fed by the streams of life-giving water. Now, of course, there is a contrast to be drawn over against that happy picture and it's the picture of the unhappy man in verses 4 and 5. The wicked are like the wind blown chaff. You know what chaff is? It's what's left behind when fruitfulness is extracted. It's the fruitless carcass. Uh, and what are they like? They're like wind-blown chaff with no resistance to the wind that blows you uncontrollably this way and that. You've lost your moorings. And you've lost your fruit. When you cast off restraint, the appearance is, of course, that you're making your own decisions. The appearance is that you master your own destiny and gain empowering, liberating, personal autonomy. But the truth is, you don't know what to do with it. You're like a dog taking off your lead. Aimlessly wandering around for your own entertainment across the countryside. Sniffing at this and that, chasing after shadows. Not knowing where you are or where you're going and lacking the fundamental relationship to your master that would make your life purposeful. Given direction, fruitful, meaningful, and eternal. Mm -hmm. The wicked like chap. Actually. And there's a reason. The reason why is in verse 6. The reason, verse 6, is for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Why is it blessed to do this? Why is it blessed to go for this walk with the Master? Because he watches over the way of the righteous. And the way of the wicked actually leads to destruction. Here's the key to the happiness of those who delight themselves in the law of the Lord and meditate on that law day and night. Here's why the righteous are happy. The discipline of the happy man puts him in a certain position in relationship to God. That's what accounts for the blessedness of the happy man. The way of the wicked, which we're all tempted to associate with casting off restraint and so on and being happy, it actually leads to destruction. We have enough in this life to show us that that principle is at work, haven't we? We can see that casting off restraint, we can see that casting off godliness leads to destruction. If you can't see that in the society around me today, where are you going to look? I mean, what we got. Because there is nothing quite so self-destructive as an unredeemed human nature. Human beings are completely destructive, aren't they? I, I, I agree that issue with so many of my non-Christian and anti-Christian friends. Why is humanity the way it is? We know we have reasons, we have Bible reasons to, to contribute. It makes sense of it. But the way of the wicked certainly, and we all observe this, leads to destruction even in this life. Why can't we see it? Why don't we want it? There is self-destructiveness about human nature and with it an arrogance that assumes and asserts that it is itself always right in what it asserts and chooses. Expect that to lead to persistence in the pursuit of the self-defined path to happiness. And that's the self-determined path to self-destruction. We were saying, weren't we? Psalm's analysis of human nature is just so obvious and it's there. It's the solutions of Psalms that people balk at. For this reason, we are innately self-destructive and innately arrogant to go with it. Mm. 
So what have we got in Psalm 1? There are two ways here that the psalmist is rejoicing over. He's rejoicing about the rightness of it all. There's something right about this. That when you live in the maker's world, the maker's way, and, and so on, and fill your mind, expose your psychology to the perfect psychology, and so on, and so on, it'll make you a healthy person. There's a rightness about that. But notice there are only two ways that he envisages. In the Bible, there is no third way to live. Here are the options. You walk in the ways of the wicked, or you delight yourself in the law of the Lord. And those are the two options in Scripture here. Those who wish to be Christian without delighting in God's Word are going to have a problem here. Is that making sense? Because you delight yourself in the law of the Lord or you walk in the counsel of the ungodly, there is no Christianized third way. We need to be so much clearer about that. Because so much of what I hear from people saying that Christianity makes you unhappy is not looking at Christianity, it's looking at that pretended Christianized third way. And we need to watch that for ourselves. The psalmist's soul's happy song celebrates this. It is delighting yourself in the law of the Lord that leads to feeding your tree with nourishment that produces fruitfulness, that produces joy in you. And that's the key to what this psalm is celebrating about happiness. It's celebrating that if you take your delight and you fix it in the right place, you'll be a happy guy. Happy lass. And by contrast, those who walk in step with the wicked are standing in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. It isn't good, it isn't right, and it ends up being not good. Because God's way is vindicated. It amounts in the end to worshipping created things rather than the creator God who is above all forever praised. And God is not mocked and there's a rightness about that. He doesn't end up watching over those who handle their delights. And choose them in that way. Should there be for the